Hello, comrades. My name is Jack Helinski Fitzpatrick from the International Marxist Tendency in Britain. If you have somehow missed the other sessions, you might notice that I am pausing. This is because this event is being translated into 12 languages at once. So these translators need time to translate. And this is allowing comrades from all over the world to participate. The speaker for this session is Hamid Elizadeh, a revolutionary with the International Marxist Tendency. And he will be speaking on the subject of post-colonialism. This is a very important discussion to have. As Marx said, the ruling ideas in any society are the ideas of the ruling class. And post-colonialism has become possibly the main theory that is taught in the universities at this time. And this is precisely because it has no answers when it comes to fighting oppression. To briefly explain the timings, Hamid will speak for 90 minutes, including translation. We will then have a 10 minute break This is much shorter than has been the case for other sessions. But we have had many requests to uh, speak in the discussion and we want to fit them all in. After the break, we will have 75. And Hamid will then sum up for 15 minutes. So I will now pass over to Hamid uh, to begin the discussion. Uh, thank you very much, Jack. Now, uh, comrades, I was at the postmodernism session yesterday. And if you weren't there, you should definitely watch it later. Uh, when we we're going to publish it on marxist.com uh, because post-colonial theory is really one of the strains of, of post-modernism which uh, which builds on the same basic ideas but the difference i would say from the purely philosophical uh, post-modernist uh, writings is that it's uh, that postcolonialism is sometimes a little bit more concrete but what that really serves to show is how extremely reactionary ideas you can reach by applying postmodernism Now, the main text, which is said to be the, the originator of this field of, of post-colonialism, is a book by uh, Edward Said called Orientalism from 1978. And uh, to be fair to Edward Said, his starting point is to criticize the deep-seated racism
which runs through capitalism, uh, Western capitalism, and in literature in particular. Official culture towards the, the Orient, so to say. Uh, by which he means the oppressed nations, although he mainly talks about the Islamic world. And of course, he has the point. Racism, as we know it, is rife in the West. West. Uh, and Edward Said criticizes this and the Western, Western academics and literary works. for how they use uh, crude generalizations about Orientals and, and Muslims in particular. And how they use a completely unempirical method. No, how they use a completely unempirical method. <laughs> And he criticizes the arrogant colonial and imperialist attitude. Uh, of, you know, of civilizing, so to say, the backward nations. And these are the same racist ideas that we hear today in, in the television and also some places in academia. Uh, like uh, the idea of the clash of civilizations, which was developed by Samuel P. Huntington in 1992, which claimed that after the collapse of the Soviet Union, there, there was a beginning of a new era of clash of civilizations and cultures. Uh, in other words, the, the clash of the Christian world with other religions, and in particular with Islam. In this vein, Muslims are portrayed as primitive peoples who desire more than anything a feudal type of society. Who, uh, who want to be ruled by heavy-handed strongmen and, and religious zealots. And Edward Said points out the extreme prejudices and generalizations that these people put forward. Uh, but he fails to draw any of the conclusions. Because then Said goes on to draw the, the broadest generalizing brush possible. For, for example, he says about the West, uh, and I'll, I'll quote here, uh, for any European during the 19th century, in what he could say about the Orient, was consequently a racist and imperialist and, a, and almost totally ethnocentric. He basically paint, portrays the whole of the West, including the working class as one united reactionary cultural bloc. And in fact, he traces the history of this block all the way to the time of Homer. 3,000 years ago. But he never served any real evidence uh, to back up these claims. Except, uh, uh, except for, the, for his interpretation of a series of literary works. In fact, he basically admits in his introduction 
the, the field he's ex examining is too vast for a systematic analysis. And, he, and instead he says that his method is to rely on a set of historical generalizations he makes that he makes in the introduction. So instead of having a scientific approach of studying a wide variety of material And, and drawing and drawing general conclusions upon upon these uh, st uh, upon studying studying these, uh, he makes a series of baseless general assumptions, and then spends the entire book trying to find literary text to prove these. And that is, in general, the, the approach of the post-colonialists. In fact, all postmodernists. To take their starting point in their own immediate personal situation. Uh, and to extrapolate this over the rest of the world, to the rest of the world. Uh, Edward Said was a literary critic. So he makes the literary word, world uh, the defining element in world history. Now, Said spends his whole book basically listing how Western authors have, uh, have an unscientific method. and that they reduce the Arabs to nothing but Muslims. But he does the exact same thing himself. In the whole book, I think it's more than 300 pages, there's not one, uh, there's no concrete examples or descriptions about Middle Eastern people. Nothing about class, and, and nothing about real culture. The Oriental person is reduced to nothing but a Muslim. In fact, in, in my notes as I was reading it, I, I, I just wrote, he's obsessed with Islam. And, and, and it's funny because that's the general theme of post-colonialism. to boil down the struggle against racism and imperialism to, to nothing but the defense of religion or rather the defense of non-Western religions against Western cultural onslaught. In other words, clash of civilizations. which is, if you remember, is the main theory of Western imperialism today. And this is the theme we'll meet again and again. That the post-colonialists end up with all of the conclusions of the imperialists. Although often it's actually even far uh, cruder even than how the bourgeois represent them. Or present them, sorry. Uh, for the post-colonialist, uh, culture, first of all, is the driving force of history. It is the racist culture in Western academia, Edward Said said, uh, and literature, which is the co which causes Western imperialism. For I'm instance, for instance, Edward Said uh, blames the Gulf, the first Gulf War in 1991, on people like Bernard Lewis and Fuad Ajami.
who were influential bourgeois historians and also advisors of George Bush uh, uh, senior at that particular time. Because as Said writes, they convinced him of the phenomenon such as the Arab mind and centuries old Islamic decline that only American power could reverse. In other words, what he's basically saying is that if he was the advisor to George Bush, if he was a top academic, the war, the war would never have happened. Uh, but today, post-colonialism is the top political theory being taught in the universities in the West. You, you, all, you, hard, you can hardly avoid reading Orientalism, uh, his book, even if you wanted to. But things have not gotten any better in terms of racism and imperialism. Imperialism is not the result of indivi the individual will of evil men or advisors. Marx already explained in the Communist Manifesto how capital once having saturate, saturated the home market is forced to go beyond its borders due to its own inherent contradictions. And spread all over the world. Uh, and that is the fundamental basis of imperialism and colonialism under capitalism. And racism is the, is the political side of this process. On the one hand, the bourgeois justify their imperialism with racism. But by whipping up nationalist hysteria, they also divide the working class along national lines. And, and rally a layer of the, of the workers behind the ruling class. Marx once famously wrote about uh, British colonialism in, uh, in, in Ireland. Um, he says, for a long time, I believed that it would be possible to overthrow the Irish regime by, by, by the working class taking power. But then he goes on to say, the English working class, he says, I, I've changed my mind. The English working class will never accomplish anything before it has gotten, written, it has gotten rid of Ireland, which was a colony. Yes, racism is a, is a very hard thing to endure if you're on the receiving end of it. Uh, but more than anything, it is, it is a weapon against the workers of the oppressing nation. It is the attempt of the bourgeois to try to convince the workers of the idea that That, that, uh, th that they have more in common with their own ruling class than with the rest of the workers around the world. Now, the post-colonialists basically repeat the same thing. Just to the, to the masses in their own countries. And therefore, they rule out any united international struggle against imperialism whatsoever. Uh, 
And in reality, these are the, the prejudices of the petty bourgeois nationalists of the oppressed nations. Which has nothing whatsoever to do with the, with the outlook of the working class. Which is instinctively uh, internationalist. L look at the Arab Revolution. On the one hand, you on the one side you had the whole world working class cheering on the Arab uh, youth and workers and poor. Even in Israel, where we were told that nothing like this could ever happen, so in some of the mass protests, there were signs of solidarity with the Arab masses. Pe people were carrying signs saying, walk like an Egyptian, fight like an Egyptian. And, and on the other side, you had all the respectable democratic bourgeois rulers in the West who always decry the inherent undemocratic primitive nature of the Arabs. And along with them, the Israeli ruling class all all lining up behind the Arab dictators. The Saudi king was insisting that Barack Obama intervene militarily to save uh, Mubarak in Egypt. But Obama couldn't enlarge, it, it, mainly in fact, uh, because of the enormous political impact it would have in the US itself, where people were, 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 solid, were showing solidarity with the Egyptian revolution. And, uh, and, and the ideas such as clash of civilizations are aimed at fighting this working class solidarity. That's the role of racism. But instead of exposing this, the post-colonialists emphasize, emphasize these exact same theories and try to prove them philosophically. They repeat the bourgeois idea that the European culture is exceptional. and that it is uh, prone to imperialism. The only difference is that they don't present it as a good thing. But if that's true, where does this imperialist culture come from? All, all we're left to assume is that it's some sort of genetic or geographic defect in Europe. which again, we can only assume being the work of some sort of divine being. 20 minutes gone, which, please which slow makes, down for translation. Okay, which makes uh, Europeans different from others. Uh, uh, the idea is that, that culture basically is the driving force of history. Which is, a, which is a completely idealist thought. And by idealism, I mean the, the philosophical notion that our ideas are the primary element and that material reality is some sort of reflection of our ideas. In the end, all sorts of idealism end up in, in, in some sort of some kind of religious thinking. But we as Marxists believe that there's only one material world.
and that our ideas are a reflection of this material world and a reflection of our material conditions. And that our ideas are a reflection of this material world and, and of our material conditions. Uh, of course, uh, we are not crude economic determinists or fatalists. Who argue that everything is, a, is an immediate reflection of simple economic factors or that everything has been decided in advance. Yes, culture, art, ideas and traditions play a huge role in society. Marx said that the traditions weigh like a mountain of the, on the back of the working class. Yes, but in the final analysis, these ideas and these, uh, these, uh, this, these cultures and traditions are determined by material reality. by the class struggle and the development of the productive forces in our society. Take for instance, the English revolution. And I recommend everyone to watch the series on the English revolution that we're publishing on marxist.com at the moment. And there we see a whole series of religious sects in, in this revolutionary struggle. I can't hear the translation. Uh, I said there we see a whole series of religious sects in the, in the struggle who uh, it, all of them, in fact, in words, fought for God the Almighty and all of them were Christian. Hello? Can you hear me? Sorry, I'm just waiting for the translator for everyone out there. I said, in words, all of these groups fought for God the Almighty, even the royalists. But in reality, each sect and each religious branch was, was uh, representing a specific class interests. In fact, all philosophies uh, and, and, and philosophical trends throughout history represent the outlook of a particular class or layer in society. Uh, now, Edward Said has a, has a particularly revealing quote uh, on his idealism. He says that the European and American interests in the Orient, i.e. in the oppressed uh, colonized nations, were created by culture. and I quote, that acted dynamically along with brute political, economic, and military rationales. To make the Orient the varied and complicated place that it is, that it obviously was in the field I called Orientalism. So it was this uh, racist Western culture, in other words, which not only defined the interests of the West, but also created the Orient, which exists primarily in the academic field of Orientalism itself.
And this is, this is obviously nonsense. But what is the practical consequences of this? It is that the way to fight imperialism is to change the professors and the middle, uh, in the Med Middle East faculties and the universities in the West. and replace them by some, some, someone non-Western. Which is something that fitted very nicely with Saeed's career ambitions. And this is something we see taken up by the activists who try to apply post-colonial thought. There's a movement in Western universities called Decolonize the Curriculum. And, and these people object to, to the imperialist propaganda in the universities. And yes, there is plenty of imperialist whitewashing of history there. But, but their solution is to demand that the present texts in the curriculum are replaced by texts by non-white authors. Uh, now, and, and many people, uh, obviously, in this movement start out uh, as genuinely radical youth who want to fight racism. But what they essentially end up saying is uh, that is not the content of the ideas that we're taught. Which defines whether they're good or bad. Or true or wrong or false. But the skin color or ethnicity of the people stating these ideas. And this is a wholly racist nation, uh, notion. And what it reflects, not in these people, but in the academics who make up these ideas, is not the desire to fight racism or capitalism, because it doesn't. In fact, post-colonialism opposes any attempt at touching private property or class rule. What it reflects is a desire of the petty bourgeois of the oppressed layers to be allowed into the top echelons of academia. Thirty minutes gone, Hamid. As I said before, all philosophical trends in the last instance reflect the, the, the position and an outlook of a particular class in society. And that's clear throughout the writings of, of the, of the post-colonialists. That they that they uh, represent the, the 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 enraged petty bourgeois of the of the uh, oppressed nations. Or a layer of them. Now, uh, this idea I explained before. That, uh, that, culture, that culture and academia somehow creates and determines the ex-colonial world. Uh, 
is quite widespread in post-colonial thought. But in reality, it boils down to a sort of subjective, a subjectivist idealism. Which is a philosophical trend which claims that, the, that the, which says that the idea of all, that all knowledge basically is subjective and that there's no objective truth. But the post-colonialists don't want to admit this. Uh, and, and following the, the Foucault and the, um, the post-structuralists or the, you know, the, the French postmodernists of the 80s, they try to cover up this subjectivism by, so to say, collectivizing it. So instead of saying that individuals are unable to know nature and society, they say that it's Eurocentric culture, which is incapable of knowing other cultures and vice versa. But then we have to ask, where does the line go? Where do you stop understanding the other side? Is it the Bosphorus, the Ural Mountains, or the borders of the European Union? And what about the different cultures inside the West? Can, can the French understand Britain? Or the different cultures, the different cities and neighborhoods. And you can go on. Uh, uh, but you inevitably end up with a subjectivist philosophy. Which is the foundation of all postmodernist thinking. But, but the thing is that the logic of, of uh, subjectivism in, inevitably le leads to uh, what's called solipsism. Which is the idea that since all knowledge is subjective, we cannot prove the existence of anyone beside ourselves. And hence, essentially, we're trapped I I I within the lonely universe of our own mind. Of course, the question then comes, if that is so, why bother proving this to everyone else? How can the post-colonialists analyze the West? Or write books for a Western audience who clearly doesn't understand them and they don't understand the West. How can they do this if there is an unbridgeable gap between Euro the Eurocentric world and the rest of the world? In fact, we can turn it around because most of these people have spent their whole lives in top academic institutions in the West. Coming from very rich families, by the way. Um, so they would basically be Eurocentric, wouldn't they? And then they couldn't possibly comment on the so-called Orient. Uh, 
Another idea that the post-colonialists are obsessed with is the idea of uh, difference. And here we really begin to see the, the, the really reactionary nature of these ideas. I'm going to talk about, uh, about one of these guys, Dipesh, uh, Dipesh Chakrabarti. who's one of the biggest names in, in post-colonial theory at the moment, in the past 10 years, maybe. And you have to forgive me for the very obscure language, but I, I, I couldn't possibly say what I'm about to say without at least giving you a little bit of a, a taste for what he's actually writing himself, because you wouldn't believe me. Now, Chakrabarti criticizes Marxism for not considering what he calls difference and responsibility to the plurality of the world. What does he mean by difference? He means that the laws of nature and society do not apply everywhere and to everyone. Uh, I'm going to quote here. I hope the translators have gotten the quotes. I sent them to them in advance. Uh, but forgive me for, 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 for this quote, <laughs> for reading it. Sorry. Although this one is not so bad. He says, for most Hindus, God's spirits and the so-called so -called supernatural have a certain reality. They are as real as ideology is, that is to say, after Zizek, that they are embedded in practices. And then he ends with the, with the uh, crown jewel, or what do you say, cherry on the cake. The secular calendar is only one of the many time worlds that we travel. So he's basically saying that for Hindus, there is a different time world inhabited by gods and spirits. And then, and now it gets really bad. I'm very sorry about this. In, in, in another place, building on the same idea, he says, one historicizes only insofar as one belongs to a mode of being in the world that is aligned with the principle of disenchantment of the universe. 40 minutes gone, Hamid. Which underlies knowledge in the social sciences and I distinguish knowledge from practice. Then he says, but disenchantment is not the only principle by which we world the earth. I'm reading this correctly, if you're wondering. <laughs> uh, sorry, I'm listening to the Spanish translation trying to translate worlding, worlding the earth. Um, then he says, the supernatural can inhabit the world in these other modes of worlding.
and not always as a problem or result of conscious belief or, or ideas. For the people listening in on Spanish, I can confirm that this translation was absolutely correct. If you didn't understand it, it's not the, the fault of the translator. But I'll translate for you what he means really into a real language. It's by his, by, by historicizing basically he means to recognize development and progress in nature and history. By historic, uh -huh. And what he's saying about this is that development and the scientific approach only applies for those of us who live in a disenchanted world. Poor us, huh? The magic has been taken out of our world. That's what it means to be disenchanted. And now we're forced to live with, develop, with, with development and the laws of nature. But there are other worlds which are still magical And uh, it appears that Dipesh Chakrabarti is a traveler between these worlds. Maybe he's writing a travel guide. Now, this is one of the most prominent academics in the world. And he's spewing this reactionary poison into the ears of thousands of young people. Is promoted all over the world in universities and academia and so on. But uh, it, this might sound like a harmless uh, quote, but, the, but he goes further because it's not only that he doesn't recognize law, that lawfulness applies everywhere. He thinks that the whole idea of lawfulness is oppressive as a, com as a concept. Everything is possible, these people say, in, in these magical worlds. Everything is possible. Nothing is necessary. But if that was the case, how would you ever be able to plan anything? Or act out any of your wishes and desires? Uh, if gravity wasn't a, a force of nature, uh, how would we be able to orientate ourselves? One day we walk off a cliff and then continue uh, uh, into the air above the abyss. The next day we might fall down and die. Or maybe we might fall up into space. Of course, it's all nonsense. The fact is that necessity and freedom go together. There can be no freedom without not lawfulness in nature.
the better we understand the laws of nature, the better we can use them to, to, to reach our aims and aspirations. And when we talk about progress in history, we, we mean, of course, the development of the productive forces, the, the development of the tools of production and of science, which increases the domination of humanity over nature. which in turn opens the path for the liberation of humanity. And that is precisely what uh, uh, Dipesh Chakravarti is against, this idea. It's the notion of progress that he's arguing against. which he thinks is oppressive, is an oppressive concept altogether. Is an, is an elitist contest, uh, concept, sorry. And here, he, what he's doing actually is, is attacking Marxism and class struggle. Uh, he claims that India, for instance, uh, that in India, the struggle is not along class lines, but along tribal and religious lines. That's, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. And to back this up, uh, he, he, he talks about how workers and peasants in India use religious symbols in their rights uh, and, and rights in their struggles. which is natural because they're religious people, most of them. But it doesn't mean that, that, uh, that, that, uh, that they, they, their actions do not have a class nature. Now, one of Chakrabarti's colleagues called uh, Ranajit Guha, he uh, has written a book where he traces the history of peasant struggles in British colonial India. It's a quite, quite a famous book in these circles. And one of the examples in this book is, uh, is an episode with a series of poor Muslims in, uh, Muslim peasants in Bengal. Who have a, who've been brutally oppressed by the landlord. who happens to be a Hindu Brahmin, an upper caste uh, Hindu landlord. And the, and the peasants, uh, uh, at, uh, basically at the night, I think, they take his cows and they, uh, they cut it in pieces and they desecrate the local Hindu temple with, with his cow like as a, as, a, as a sign of defiance. Fifty minutes gone, Hamid. Now, now there are two two trends in this uh, particular struggle. One is the class struggle, which is clear here, is poor peasants against a rich landlord. And one is the particular, particular form of, that this struggle takes, which is uh, on, on religious lines.
But what Guha and, and Chakrabarti defend uh, is, uh, sorry, let me just say, um, the, the, these religious lines, obviously, they are uh, the weakness of the movement because in that way, they cannot connect with other poor peasants who are Hindus. But what, what Guha and Chakrabarti defend is not the class nature of these uprisings. But the religious nature, which they, which they actually raise to a principle. And in fact, they go as far as saying that this is somehow the Indian form of modernity. That is, they raise this type of struggle on religious lines to, to a political principle. But what would it mean in practical terms? If you put the desecration of cows in Hindu temples on the program of a political party. Will it achieve liberation for the poor Indian peasants? No, it's, it's, it's a recipe for sectarianism. But they go even further. They claim that the, that the notion of class struggle, socialism, and even national liberation itself are elitist and oppressive notions in themselves. Because they impose on the religious and tribal nature of Indian society. And of course, all of these ideas align perfectly with the religious zealots in, in India. And everywhere else. Now, I have another quote by, by Chakrabarti. This one is uh, maybe a little bit more understandable. Uh, he says, for however cynical one may be in one's analysis of the, of the, uh, of the re reasons, and he puts reasons in quotation marks, uh, of the reasons why the Hindu political parties might want to use the Hindu card. And reason in quotation marks, yeah. Uh, one still has to ask the question about the many different meanings that divine figures such as God King Rama assumes in our negotiations with, with modernity. You have to see this in a context to make sense, but I'll translate it for you. What is he's talking about the Hindutva movement, the, um, the, which is a reactionary Hindu fundamentalist movement. Hindutva, uh, and uh, I don't know how you pronounce it, but anyway, um, but the, the movement was, was not, he said, they, they say basically that the movement is not the result of the betrayal of the Indian revolution by Congress or by the Stalinists. But that is a real religious movement based on the inherent nature of Indians. In other words, that, that the Indian masses are rejecting class struggle and nationalism and going to their true, true, uh, um, how do you say, 
natural kind of a place to be, a political home. Of course, political is oppressive and elitist, so we wouldn't call it that either. And this is not only exactly what the religious fundamentalists say, it is exactly, although put a bit more crudely, what the imperialist chauvinists say. And, and he goes on, uh, and, and, I, and I quote here, uh, sorry again for, for the translate, translators. Uh, the bringing together of these different time worlds in the construction of a modern public life in India has always had something to do with all the major crises uh, of modern India. What does he mean by that? that it is the clash of modernity, i.e., well, development, uh, advanced capitalism or developed civilization, bourgeois civilization, and traditional time or traditional worlds, which is the cause behind the Hindutva movement. Uh, or actually, it's the cause behind all the major social crises in India. In modern India. Uh, and, uh, and basically, what, what is the conclusion of this? That what is necessary is to go back in time. Before capitalism ruined the time worlds of India. With, with its elitist notions of democracy and science and desire for higher living standards. Of course, that's not really what capitalism brought to India, but that is, that is basically what he is saying. I'll get back to that. Um, that is basically what post-colonialism boils down to. It's a hostility towards science. It's a hostility to class struggle. And it's a fetishizing of backwardness and religion. And what it reflects is the total decay of bourgeois nationalism in the oppressed nations. And it is spitting in the face of the hundreds of millions of workers and, and peasants and poor who've launched wave after wave of revolutionary struggles in the colonial world. Not for a return to some pre-capitalist era, which by the way was not that uh, hunky-dory either, But for, for, but for national liberation, for democracy, and, and for a way out of the barbarism of real imperialist oppression. Sixty minutes gone, Hamid. And these people, they don't even talk about, the, not, in none of these books you talk about the real oppression, the violent oppression, uh, imperialist oppression that the, that the imperialists brought to these countries. They talk about the, uh, the enlightenment, uh, scientific ideas, notions of progress, class struggle. This is what they, they point out is the reactionary part of all of this. And capitalism, capitalism came to the world in Europe uh, at first, fighting against backwardness and mysticism and ob obscurantism originally. And it played an incredibly progressive role. 
it it uh, it uh, it swept away the complex web of classes and layers which were holding society back. It it destroyed the previous land relations. It freed the peasants. It abolished the landlord class. It united whole nations and destroyed uh, feudal society with this myriad of small statelets. And, and, and of course, these were all huge steps forward for humanity. But in, his, in the face of imperialism, capitalism turns into its opposite. And it is a complete lie to say, as the post-colonialists do, that capitalism was trying to modernize the oppressed nations. Attempting push society forward in revolutionary strength. Out of the out of, out of barbarism and backwardness, but and and the and the Buddha had lived in society, but only written on what the mountain is on the sectarians and the tribal people. Yeah, tribalism, not the tribal people. Sorry, um, and uh, um, and these were the ones who were who were pushing for sectarianism and 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 pushing for 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 a religious way out of uh, uh, to push the struggles into a religious direction. And the sectarians, we have to be clear: the the, the religious sectarians are absolute enemies of the working class and the poor. But you often hear post-colonialist, uh, post-colonial uh, thinkers defend these people. But they were allied with the imperialists in trying to sabotage any attempt at modernizing society throughout the history of, of all of the col uh, colonized uh, nations. And the oppressed nations. I don't. I can't hear the translation. Oh yeah, the sectarians were were allied with the imperialists. They had an alliance to sabotage an attempt at uh, any attempt at uh, dividing. Uh, sorry, modernizing society. Now I'm getting confused. <laughs> yes. And they and they sabotaged again together the two of them sabotaged any attempt of achieving bourgeois democracy. It was the British who who time and time again leaned on sectarianism to divide and rule India. Which ended in the in the in the in the criminal partition of India, which led to millions of deaths. It was the British and U.S. imperialists who who poured billions of dollars and pounds. Into, into maintaining Islamic fundamentalism in the Middle East for decades, to this day. Saudi Arabia would not exist a single day if it wasn't for the support of the imperialists. Al-Qaeda wouldn't exist a single day if it wasn't for the support of imperialists throughout, throughout time. Even the Islamic State wouldn't exist if it wasn't for, 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 the, for the Western imperialists. 
And also in Africa, the, 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 the different Western powers have, have been leaning on tribalism all over Africa. In order to defend their privileges and continue the, the, the plunder of the continent. And the, and the, uh, the, the, the post-colonialists are extremely dishonest, I would say, and ignore all of this. And if they mention it, they draw no conclusions. It's just like a footnote. Um, you didn't uh, translate the last part. Uh, if, they, if they mention it, it's only as a footnote, as a, as a side comment. Uh, and instead, um, they said what they, what they do is that they attack what was progressive in early capitalism. Which, of course, capitalism is not able to offer anymore. And if you notice, in all of these basic ideas put forward by the post-colonials, they fully align with the ideas promoted by the imperialists. Rather, the ideas promoted and acted out by the imperialists. Um, and, and in reality, they don't fight imperialism and capitalism at all. Their real struggle is against Marxism and the working class. And that's why the bourgeois have no problem with promoting them around the world. In the education system, where, where they're one of the dominant, if not the dominant trend. And here they play the role of capturing uh, radical young people who are looking for a way out of the dead end of capitalism. Now, sometimes I hear some people say, we shouldn't dismiss all of these theories, just dismiss them blanket. You know, maybe there's something we can use, we can learn something. But I strongly agree, disagree with this idea. Uh, we, we, we need, as Marxists, we need to wage a determined struggle against these ideas. Because the post-colonial post -colonial ide co ideas are reactionary from top to bottom. And whatever you can learn from them, I'll tell you, if you get a little bit educated, you get far more miseducated. And, uh, and if you learn anything, you would learn a thousand times, the same thing, a thousand times better and clearer from the writings of Marx, Engels, Lenin, and Trotsky. And what these guys represent is, is a disguised counter-revolution in the universities and the schools. 70 minutes gone. And our task, yeah, sorry. And our task is to expose these ideas one by one. And to win over the youth to the only ideas which are really able to defeat imperialism and racism. Which are the ideas of Marxism. In, uh, in, in, look, in India, South Africa, throughout the Middle East, formal liberation from imperialism has been achieved. But what has changed for the masses after the skin color of their rulers changed? The living standards continue to decline. Corruption and nepotism are rife. 
and the imperialists still dominate them via the banks and the world market. Of course, with, with the help of the local capitalists, who have, a, who have a domestic skin color, who have a domestic skin color. On a capitalist basis, there's no way out for the masses. That, uh, it, and in fact, the struggle against imperialism and, and the struggle against capitalism are the same. And I'll tell you what, a, a victory against imperialism in any of the oppressed countries would be a victory for the working class in the advanced capitalist countries because the enemy is the same. And the other way around, a, re a revolution in any of the advanced capitalist countries would weaken imperialism in the, in the oppressed nations. Capitalism is, in is international. And it's built an international working class. Uh, and the workers have no nations. Workers from all countries have far more in common with each other than any of their rulers. And that's what we stand for and that's what we have to raise. Against racism and nationalism, we raise the banner of internationalism. Against fundamentalism and sectarianism, we, we, we put forward the ideas of class struggle. And against capitalism and imperialism, We stand for socialism, which is the only way to liberate all of humanity from the barbarism and decay of class society. Thank you very much. <laughs>